Hello all and welcome to this very special episode. But before we begin, I would like to thank everyone listening. Today we hit 40,000 subscribers, a seriously impressive milestone. And of course, it could have never been achieved if it wasn't for you amazing guys constantly listening. So thank you to each and every one of you. It's honestly so humbling how many of you enjoy my content. Today, I'm accompanied by the sensational Mr. Davis, with some stories that are surely going to mess with your head. It's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. My father was stationed in Germany in the 80s, in the US Army, and every 10 years or so, they would do what's called a winter reforger, which was basically a giant game of war, where two sides competed against each other, and my dad happened to be there during one. Him and his buddy operated a tank, but due to some complications, they needed reinforcements, so they had to stay put and wait. They got bored, which is understandable, and walked to a small town nearby to get a bottle of apple corn, which is a type of alcohol. As they walked into the town, they saw a young boy riding a bicycle. They stopped him and asked him to the nearest place where they could get a bottle and he gave them directions. As they were following his directions, they saw a bar with a bunch of people in it, but for some reason, the kid never mentioned it. They went in anyway. As soon as they walked in though, everyone stopped what they were doing, and just started staring at my dad and his buddy. Literally, everyone, including the waitress. After about five seconds, everyone simultaneously started acting normally again, as if nothing ever happened. You can imagine that they were a little creeped out, but asked to buy a bottle of apple corn. However, they refused to sell him one, instead giving them both free shots. After this, the people kept insisting that they sit down to eat, they were passing around giant bowls of food, and everyone would take some from the bowl and pass it to someone else. But my dad didn't want any food. They just wanted to buy a bottle of apple corn. But they kept refusing, only offering shots and food. Finally, they got tired of it and left. As they were walking around looking for somewhere else to get the apple corn, they passed the young boy again and asked him about the bar and why they refused to sell the apple corn. The boy turns pale and stammers, you, you went to that place? He immediately cycles away as fast as he possibly can. My buddy and my dad look at each other confused, curious. They walk back to the bar to check it out again. But when they get there, the bar is completely empty. The lights are off, and they stare inside through the glass. The chairs are all upside down on the table, with cobwebs everywhere and dirt on the ground. The shelves behind the bar are completely empty, and are not stacked with alcohol. They check around the whole area to make sure it was the same place, and sure enough, it was the same bar, where only a few minutes before, it had been crowded with people. They then found another bar and bought some apple corn, and quickly got the hell out of there. To this day, my dad and his buddy swear on it, and it's the creepiest thing that they've ever witnessed. It was the early 2000s. It is 3 a.m. and my house phone starts ringing. The phone was on the other side of the room. I stand up on the bed and start heading over for the low dresser to answer it. 
and my wife gets up to get the phone as well. By this time, it's the third ring, and I remember thinking, crap, it's going to go to voicemail. The ringing stops. Then my cell phone starts ringing. I immediately change gears to, someone really needs to get a hold of me. I grab my phone. Caller ID is 000000000. I answer. Hello? A voice comes through the line as though it was a distance overseas call. Parting through the static and asking, Is this Joel? To which I reply, Yes, who's this? Immediately, it was as though those words, Is this Joel? were being pulled back through the line, echoing in reverse. There was static, and then the call dropped. Jump forward several years. I'm installing a phone system that we're joking around is so advanced that we could place calls back in time. I punch in my old phone number and call it, realizing that the number is still active and my wife might answer. I hang up and call my now years old retired phone number. Somebody answers. I freak out and ask, is this Joel? The voice on the other end of the line answers through space and time. Yes, who's this? At that instant, I immediately remember taking that call, and I'm struck dumb. I cannot speak. Without thinking, I reflexively press the hang up button. I am now freaked out. I look over to my colleague who isn't as freaked out as I am. From his perspective, I called the number and someone with the same name answered. But he realized that was my voice on the other end of the line. I told him, I got that call. It was five years ago, but I got that call. Then we both freak out. I redial and get a message that the number is no longer in service. I call my home number and my wife answers. I tell her I'm testing a phone system and ask if she's had any previous calls. Nope. None. I'm kind of freaking out, but with her on speakerphone, I ask her, Hey, do you remember that 3 a.m. call we got those years back? Yes where I was asked, is this Joel, and then the line went dead? Yeah. I'm now just looking at my colleague with my wife still on speakerphone. Do you remember what year that was? Hmm, it was way before we had kids, so it had to have been in the 2002 time frame. I don't know how to say this, but I'm pretty sure that was me that called. I spent about two and a half weeks backpacking in the Olympic National Park. The weirdness happened about a week in. I say about, because the memory of the timetable of events is a bit fuzzy. But I remember that I had gone bushwalking the day before. The game trail that I'd been following started to widen a little. And by midday of the second day, I reached an abandoned cabin. It had obviously been neglected for a long time. The roof was covered in moss, and the wooden walls seemed to be suffering from rot. Some weather seemed like it was going to move into the area, so I thought I'd take a break inside. It had a musty smell, like wet stone or damp crawl space, and rotting wood of course. Despite the smell, the cabin was quite spacious inside. Incredibly so, actually. There were two rooms, I remember, and a third door that went down a long, gently sloping stone tunnel that led down into what I assumed was the cellar. Looking back, I don't see how such a feature wouldn't have been visible from the outside. But there it was. I turned on a flashlight and started walking down. It went on for an impossibly long distance. I had gone about a hundred yards and my flashlight beam just faded into the darkness when I shone it down the path ahead. This was not a cellar. There was a stifling, claustrophobic silence that seemed to press down on me the further I went. The darkness was disorienting and it felt almost intoxicating. I probably stumbled onto a pocket of poorly oxygenated air. Whatever it was, I'm glad I had enough sense to leave. 
I nope out of there pretty quickly. And here's the strange thing. Though I know I couldn't have gone more than 100 or 200 yards down that tunnel, I wasn't inside the cabin for even an hour. But by the time I got out of it, it was morning. I had spent the better part of a day inside. Needless to say, I backtracked and got out of there pretty quickly. Back in July of 2016, I ended up homeless and living out of my car, and in an attempt to make the best out of the bad situation, I decided to take my savings and travel across the country. I didn't find a place until late December, so I have quite a few stories of weird shit happening during the six-ish months I was rolling around in absolute solitude. The creepiest thing, though, would probably be the day I spent in central Nevada. Nevada State Route 375 is a desolate stretch of land, flat and sandy save for the scrub bushes and the 300,000 head of cattle meandering through the 220-mile stretch of open rangeland. On either side of the road, at a distance that feels close but isn't, stand plateaued mountains as barren as the land itself the walls of racetrack long forgotten. The road is famous in certain circles for its affectionate nickname, the Extraterrestrial Highway, brought about because of its function as the only major road near Area 51. And aside from the 54-person town just as many miles in, it's empty. After waking up in a gas station in Las Vegas, I powered north along Highway 93, a barren but not necessarily uninhabited road, high on the promise of adventure. I'm from a large city on the east coast, so places like that, places where there's almost nothing but nature, are absolutely breathtaking to me. I saw a few cars, a few houses, and a few trees, so 93 seemed like a normal back road, and I expected 375 to be the same. Only, when I got to the junction of the two did I realize things weren't going to be entirely what I expected. The first thing I saw was a large metal building, almost like a small plane hangar up on the hill, with what looked like a poorly made statue of an alien standing by the main door. It was one of those campy tourist attractions, and there was no way I could leave without some kind of souvenir, so I pulled into the level dirt area at the base of the hill and parked. There wasn't a path to the building though, so I climbed my way up the steep pile of sand on my hands and knees chalking it up to part of the experience and went inside. Despite the fact that the door was open, the place was dark and empty. I wandered around for a little, looking at rows of campy t-shirts, eventually running into the restroom and back, a little disappointed and more than a little creeped out. By the time I left, empty-handed, save for a small pamphlet about the area that had been marked free, it was a little before 11. I kept driving, only then realizing how desolate 375 was compared to any other road I'd been on. I saw a few live cows and the occasional carcass, but other than that, there was absolutely nothing. No trees, no people, no buildings, no grass, as far as the eye could see. It was the first time I'd ever been in anything that could truly be considered a desert. The map on the back of the brochure wasn't much of a map at all. It was a black line that was supposed to signify 375, and a red dot some ways to the east of that was apparently Area 51. After about half an hour, I came to a spot that looked like a sandy turnaround on the side of the road with a bent stop sign facing out randomly into the desert. I figured this had to be it. So, against all better judgment, I turned my silver VW sedan off the paved highway and drove and drove, and drove, and drove. There were no signs, just me driving across the open desert towards something I wasn't even sure even actually existed. I realized then that I had no cell service and probably hadn't for quite some time. If I got a flat tire, ran out of gas, or got lost, I would have no way to call for help. But because I had come that far, I decided to just keep going. Some intermediate amount of time later, I came across a crumbling farmhouse, barn, wooden building, smack in the middle of nowhere, and decided at least that I was headed in the right direction. 
There was one sign, an ominous looking wooden arrow painted bright neon green, the kind of color you usually associate with little green men, so I kept going. Reaching the entrance to Area 51 was just as startling as it was anticlimactic. It was in a desert far, far away from rock bowl walls, and then suddenly the base of the mountain was right in front of me. There was a barbed wire coil on the ground and a sign that said, Air Force Property, no trespassing, no drones, no photography, or something like that right on the edge, with nothing discernible on the other side. Being the wild, rebellious kid I am, I took pictures anyway. This is where it starts to get kind of weird. I'd done what I could do, so I turned my car around and headed back to the direction I came. It was important to note that on my way to Area 51, I traveled in a straight line. And going back toward the main road, I also traveled in a straight line. Yet somehow, after another length of intermediate time... I never came across that farmhouse again. The panic started to set in because I couldn't see the road in the distance and I couldn't see that crumbling building in any direction. So I drove faster than I probably should have across the rough desert. In an effort of keeping myself from getting a flat or losing control of the car, I turned on cruise control, but it kept cutting out for some reason and my car would roll to a complete stop if I wasn't paying attention. I spent the better part of however long I was out there freaking the fuck out because I wasn't sure if I was going in the right direction. The sun hadn't seemed to move across the sky at all. I had no way to tell if I was going west or northwest or southwest or whatever. I never saw that building again, and when I finally made it back to 375, I was on a different portion of the road than the one I'd initially turned off of. No stop sign, no turnaround, just cracked pavement. I decided to keep going along 375 in hopes of finding that the town I knew was there and happened to glance at the clock in my car. I thought I'd been keeping track of how long I'd been in the desert, looking down every few seconds and the lack of solar movement had me convinced I'd been on the main road for maybe an hour at most. Except it was nearly 3 o'clock. I had almost spent 4 hours searching for Area 51 and then making my way back and had absolutely no idea that that much time had passed. The entire experience was surreal. I never actually found the town that was supposedly out there, just a bar where I stopped to fill up my gallon jugs of water. There were three people inside, no cars in the parking lot, and according to the bartender, no other buildings for 110 miles. I didn't bother fact checking or asking about Rachel Nevada. She told me that I'd die out there in the desert if I didn't have a tank full of gas. And that even if I did, I'd probably die anyway because the roads weren't maintained and the cattle had a tendency to collapse in the middle of the highway and rot there. A hazard. I thanked her and got in my car and turned the fuck around. By the time I hit Highway 93, I was driving well over 118 miles per hour, convinced that there was something more to the overwhelming emptiness of this place and that it would follow me back to the interstate. I still have so many questions about everything that happened that day. Why did I end up at a different part of the road than I'd started? How the hell did four hours pass without me noticing? Where did the people in the bar come from? Why was there a bar out there in the first place? What was that first metal building I'd came across and why was it open but empty? It was an irrational, unfounded fear, likely born from the fact that, as a city girl, I've never been anywhere so desolate. But damn if that shit wasn't genuinely creepy as hell. A couple of weeks ago, my friend's dad told me a pretty bizarre story that scarred me for life. About 15 years ago, my friend's parents, Steve and Julie, were woken up at 1am by a very loud thud that rattled the house. Worried that one of the kids had fallen out of the bunk bed, Steve went downstairs to check on them. But all three kids were sound asleep and safe in their beds. Julie told Steve to check out the house in case of an intruder. So Steve checks the doors and windows before going outside to take a look. After 10 minutes of investigating the noise, Steve comes across nothing unusual and went back inside to go to bed. He found his wife absolutely worried sick 
and she demanded to know where the hell he had gone and what happened. Confused and tired, Steve told her that he found nothing and he tried to calm her down. Before Julie pointed out that it was now 4am and he had been missing for three hours. Julie had gone outside to check on him and he was nowhere to be found and didn't respond to her calling his name. Unable to figure out what happened, they returned to bed and slept until Steve had to get up for work in a few hours. Steve owns a painting business and a couple of hours after working on a house, he noticed that his eyes began to feel itchy. Then, his eyes started to burn. And after a couple of hours, his eyes burned so badly, he was holding his eyelids open as to not blink because it felt like his lids were sandpaper against his eyes. His employees rushed him to the hospital and Steve was treated for second degree flash burns on his eyes. He was told his burns were the equivalent of staring at welder torches without eye protection for an extended period of time. His eyes were treated and he was lucky to have his vision fully restored. He is one of the most stand-up guys I know and the way he told the story gave me the creeps. Dead serious and no explanation for what happened. His wife was there too and she was visibly upset when he was telling me that story. When I was in high school, I had a habit of taking power naps while everyone was having lunch. I'd curl up in a quiet part of the hallway, pull my jacket over my face, and sleep for maybe 15 minutes. This one time, I was startled out of sleep by a passing crowd of my fellow students. Everyone was in a rush to make it in time before our strict teacher would start taking note of absences. I ran after the crowd, walking up the stairs to the right classroom, and sat at the only desk that was left for me. The teacher told us to open our books, the world froze, and suddenly the situation sort of reset. I was back in the hallway, and blinking sleep out of my eyes because I'd been awoken by passing students. I thought it was just some funny coincidence, some kind of brain fart. I went up the stairs after the others and then sat at the same empty desk. The teachers told us to open our books and again, reset. The same two or so minutes, wake up the noise, go up the stairs after others, sit at the same desk, teachers tell class to open books and replay it again. For the first few loops, while it was still more interesting than terrifying, I had so many questions. Was I having an intense nightmare? Was I going insane? I was and am atheist, with zero belief in anything paranormal, so no options other than this isn't real didn't cross my mind. Some loops later, I started doing all of those things that I would read about online to see if it was a dream. You know, reading signs, trying to put my hand through a wall while looking away, that kind of stuff. Everything seemed as real as reality to me. My theories and contemplations got more outlandish. If there was some sort of complex temporal situation going on and the loop would continue indefinitely, would I eventually die of hunger? At the same time, I tried to mess around with the loop to see if something would happen. Deviating from the route did nothing. I tried staying in the hallway or going outside, but after the two or so minutes, I was always back in the hallway, regardless of my actions. I tried to engage other students and teachers, but everyone seemed preoccupied with their own task. If I managed to get someone to talk to me, they were always irritated with whatever I did that deviated from the loop. You shouldn't skip class, or the teacher's going to be mad if we're late. The same default responses, same tones, over and over. I even tried injuring myself with scissors, an incredibly ill-advised move, I know, but at that stage, I was basically out of my mind with fear. Luckily, it only resulted in the loop resetting faster. I honestly don't know how many repeats of the loop I experienced, because I soon stopped counting. As I was getting more and more scared, I stopped wondering about the inexplicable hows and whys. 
As far as I could tell, the situation could not be explained, at least by me, and I was the only variable in the loop, so I became obsessed with the idea that perhaps a certain behavior was required or expected of me. But in those scenarios, there was usually some sort of event that had to be either prevented or instigated. In my case, there was nothing. My self-imposed goal became to stop acting like I was aware of the loop, so I tried to replicate my behavior from the first loop down to the finest detail to my best recollection. It changed nothing, but I latched onto the idea of perfecting this routine because I had nothing else. Loop after loop after loop of the same thing. They all blur together in my memory. When you're scared of a fate potentially worse than death, it's incredibly easy to stop asking questions and just function on autopilot. The thing is, I'd have written the whole thing off as a dream if not for the very last loop. By then, I'd completely accepted my fate in some sort of limbo when the loop no longer reset. My teacher told the class to open our books, and where I'd usually woken up, in the hallway again, the world... hung, I guess. I don't know how else to describe it. Time seemed to pause for less than a second, just like you might experience in a game when you quick save. And then the teacher went on with the lesson of the day. Life went on. In college, I frequented a trail in the Appalachian Mountains near my college. Each time I would trek further and further, and I never saw anyone else on it, no matter how good the weather was. So I always just saw it as my own personal trail. For a while, I would walk to a large stream and turn back since it was wide and deep and I didn't want to get my boots soaking wet. But one day, I was determined to cross the stream so I moved several planks of sturdy dead tree to make a makeshift bridge. I crossed to the other side and everything felt subtly different. The air was different, the sky was brighter and surprisingly, the trail on the other side was better maintained than the part I had come from. As I kept walking, I was noticing a lot of old soda cans lying around. The ones that are more perfectly cylindrical, and wasn't seeing any of the modern day soda can designs. I passed an old cabin. It looked occupied, so I didn't bother investigating it on my way along. I kept walking, until I got to a wider stream. I wouldn't be able to make a bridge to cross it, so I turned around and headed back. I distinctly remember the sky turning overcast within a matter of minutes. I couldn't clearly see the sky, since the trees blocked a lot of my view. I had just assumed a cloud had passed across the sun, but when I got a better look, the sky was completely different. It felt like I was walking along a completely different trail. This is the craziest part. I was following my steps back, and I look over to see where the cabin had been, to find nothing but the remains of the cabin. All that was left was the stone chimney. I had walked by the cabin an hour ago, and there weren't any ashes, no smoke, and there was a thick layer of leaves, fallen, and some litter, modern day litter, like beer bottles and cans with modern logos. I was dumbfounded, and explored the cabin's remains for a good hour until it started to drizzle. I walked back along the trail. The old soda cans were gone, and the bridge that I had built was gone. I couldn't see the logs further down the stream and the rest of the trail was just as I had remembered it. I walked the last mile or so of the trail in darkness and rain, guided by my phone, which would never get reception up in the mountains. So, that's my weird time traveling story. I made a point of wanting to go back to my college town so that I could revisit the trail and see what was on the other side of the big stream. If anyone lives nearby, the coordinates to the trailhead 
are available in the description. You can park in the rest stop. When I was younger, most likely six or seven years old, I can distinctly remember playing with a few of the older children in my neighborhood, doing things like drawing with chalk and playing tag, simple games that we played in our cul-de-sac. The little boy and girl I played with, I can still remember in detail. The boy's name was Randy, and the girl we called Lily. Randy was light-skinned and had dark hair, while Lily had bright red hair and darker skin. I was dark-skinned and dark-haired. Physical attributes aside, both of them were very boisterous, and we all loved to run around and play until the sun set, and my mom called me in, and then the both of them would run back to their houses until the next time we were out to play. It was a sweet little friendship, and it was pretty normal, except for a few things. When we would draw with chalk, both Randy and Lily's favorite things to draw were these little symbols with random words after them. I now realize that those symbols were very close to some symbols I'd seen, but for the life of me could not remember where, and I can remember some of the words they wrote having to do with terms that I still do not recognize. My mom would come outside with juice boxes sometimes while we were drawing, and laugh at my friend's cute made-up language as she called it. One morning, I went out to play with my friends, only to find them sitting on the curb, sulking. When I asked them why they were sad, they simply told me that they had to leave because, and I quote, we've got to go back to 2137. I asked where that was, and they said it was later. They told me to sit right there and wait a minute so they could bring me something to remember them by. I did what they told me, and soon enough they had returned, bearing what I have chalked up to one of the strangest gifts I have been given to date. They were a little rainbow hairbrush that sparkled, a small unmarked tube of what I was informed was lotion, and a small box that looked like it was carved out of a gym. They handed me my gifts, which I promptly tried out, brushing my hair and using some of the lotion on my wrist so they knew I wasn't going to just throw them aside, and hugged me before running back to their respective homes. My memory cuts out at this point, but the next thing I remember is waking up, sleepily rubbing my pale skin hand across my face to brush away my bright red hair and going to ask my mom if Randy and Lily had left. My mother had no idea who I was talking about. Our neighbors had no children. She did not remember me being born with dark skin and dark hair. No one did. That was the day that Randy and Lily disappeared from the face of the earth, leaving me with an unfamiliar new appearance, a tube of hand lotion, and a tiny comb and a glittery little box that sits on my mantle this day, which I still have no idea how to open. When I was 18, my best friend called me very late one night at 1.43am. He left me a voicemail to call him back. I wasn't near my phone when he called, and I called him back not three minutes later at 1.46am but got his voicemail this time. He sounded distressed, as if something were really wrong. I was concerned, but went back to bed anyway. The next morning, I was at work and sitting in the middle of a staff meeting, when I felt as if I were about to throw up. I went to the bathroom and started heaving my guts out. I just assumed I'd eaten something bad the previous night. I was doing outside sales at the time, so I left to go to my next appointment. I was driving along and my phone rang. It was my best friend's girlfriend, and she was crying uncontrollably. I couldn't understand her, until finally she screamed, John's dead. My best friend had been in a car accident the previous night and hit a semi-truck, head on whilst he was driving home. There are two things to this day that makes it hard to sleep every time I think about it. The first is that the paramedics pronounced him dead at 1.43am, the exact same time of the missed call. The accident had to have happened at least 10 to 15 minutes before. I still have no explanation for it to this day. I grew up in the Arctic. In the town I lived in, as long as it was a clear night, it was an extremely normal occurrence to see all sorts of strange lights move across the sky. 
Keep in mind that winter is long in the Arctic, which means longer amounts of time being spent under the stars. It's quite beautiful as long as you don't mind the cold so much. Sometimes I would drive a snowmobile a few kilometers out of town, shut it down, and just lay in the snow, looking up at the majesty of it all. The only thing disturbing the silence being the occasional breeze. The northern lights are also a common occurrence. It doesn't happen every day, but often enough that they start to get ignored after a while, as long as they aren't too spectacular anyway. On one particular night, without asking my parents, it was their snowmobile, I decided to go out on one of my midnight drives out of town. I drove a few kilometers over the hill to find a spot devoid of light pollution from town, shut off the machine, and settled into a good spot to look up and be retrospective. It wasn't all that interesting a scene. A few satellites passed by here and there, some relatively boring activity from the magnetic field, etc. And then I started noticing a clicking noise. At first I thought it was the sound of the snow machine cooling down as engines expand and contracts a lot in the cold. But the source of the sound definitely wasn't coming from that direction. My next thought was that there must be an animal nearby, in which case I needed to get out of there fast. You don't really want to mess with a wild animal. But the clicking was far too regular for an animal to produce it. It was fairly mechanical sounding, and again, the source of the sound isn't coming from anywhere around me laterally. It was coming from up. So, naturally, I look up, determined to ascertain the origin of this strange noise. I see what I always see. Stars, northern lights, a lazy satellite coming across the sky. All normal stuff. But before I dismiss it altogether and begin heading home, I noticed something strange in the Aurora Borealis. There were three rather strong points of light. I ignored them at first, thinking they were oddly symmetrical stars, but this proved false. They were definitely getting brighter. I kept staring in morbid fascination as they grew stronger and stronger, yet still only remaining single points in the sky. All the while, the clicking noise is getting louder and louder, more pronounced, almost like starting with tapping a pin on a desk to clacking billiard balls together inside my head. And then it stops. The lights are gone, the clicking is not heard, and aside from being a little stiff, cold, and rather petrified, I'm fine. So I jump back on the snowmobile, thinking maybe I'm going crazy. The machine takes a little longer than usual to start up, and I'm beginning to worry, but soon it's running and I'm heading back to town. As I'm driving back, several plausible scenarios as to what occurred are running through my head. I'm thinking it could have been a helicopter from the mine, or some strange northern lights behavior, etc. Probably not that big of a deal. I pull up to my house. Lights are all dark. Strange, as it wasn't that late when I left. I open the outer doors as quietly as possible, remove the winter gear, and enter the inner door. The house is quiet. Really quiet. My parents are teachers and are usually up late marking or watching TV. All I'm thinking is I have to get to bed without anyone noticing. Proves to be easy as I'm soon under my covers. I set an alarm for the next day and all of a sudden everything makes sense. The engine was hard to start, I was stiff, rather chilly, nobody up when I was gone what felt like a relatively short period of time. It was almost 11pm when I left and now it was creeping up on 6am. I stood, staring at clicking lights for almost 7 hours. I never ended up sleeping that night and didn't go on late night snow machine rides anymore. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I've been holding on to this topic for a while. It's one of my favourite topics ever, so I needed a special occasion to release it. And special thanks to Mr. Davis for his help in this video. It's very much appreciated. Thanks for coming along. Please, go check out Mr. Davis' channel and show him some love. He really, really deserves it. He's actually done this topic a few times before, 
and after listening to one of his videos, I was inspired to try and find more of these stories. So, there's a link on screen now to check out even more of these stories. So why not give it a click if you want more? But anyway, for now guys, I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.